Hey listeners, Mallory Wilsey here, chief producer of the Enrollify Network. I get the privilege of working alongside all of our creators at Enrollify, but I wanted to take just a quick moment to tell you about why I love the Talking Tactics podcast hosted by Diana Kibbolds. Every other Tuesday, Day drops a new episode where she focuses on a single tactic that moved the needle on any enrollment metric, from inquiries and booth visitors to apps completed and deposits, even registrations, you name it. The catch? The tactic had to be done with limited resources, either by a single person or a small but mighty team, or limited time, or maybe without a lot of money. The podcast format is fun and engaging, and it's just different from the more traditional 60-minute interview-style shows. If you work in enrollment management or marketing, be sure to give Day's show a listen. You can subscribe to the show by visiting podcast.enrollify.org or just search Talking Tactics wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Generation AI, the podcast where we demystify artificial intelligence in the world of higher ed. I'm your host, Artis Gadu, joined by my insightful co-host, Dr. JC Bonilla. Hello, JC. Hello, everybody. Hello, Artis. Hello, world. Welcome to episode 32. Can you believe that? 32 renditions of how AI, technology, higher education, and awesome personalities, you and I, come together, Artis. I mean, it's what, this is now six months that we've been doing this. It's crazy. Six months? <laughs> wow. Time flies, time flies. Artis, speaking of enjoyment, I, I thought this episode was going to be very interesting. In a way, I requested this episode, right? Because at Engage about a month ago, as I'm socializing and talking to friends, something was the chatter, right, of... Did you guys see this app? Did you guys see this new feature? Did you guys hear about the voice assistance that Element introduced? And I'm like, what? And also what I started hearing is that Element has introduced this kind of application of AI where it's activated via voice. So in other words, we switch from texting. I, I need to search for JC Bonilla, the student, to sending the command to the CRM via voice. But the applications are basically endless. So artists, what I love to understand today is how do you build that and what's the state of the art of voice activated LMs and assistance because that's where it's going. You already uh, introduced an element, but it's super, super exciting to hear more about it. So love to see if you can give me that kind of tech review of voice models and, and generative AI. Yeah, no, I, I think voice is really important. We did our, our last episode was on travel. And one of the things that I like to use on travel is uh, when I when I drive is I can't type, obviously, on chat GPT. And as I'm trying I to get, type even without driving, <laughs> even with my with my thinking through, it's like they have a voice command. So essentially, you can go to voice mode and now you can talk into it and come back. Uh, it's not the best, but it actually, you know, gives you a lot of that content back and forth via voice, which is incredible, right? So now you can use something AI. Well, think about it the same way from from the element perspective. We now introduced a uh, a microphone button, so you can actually talk into the AI assistants and our chatbots, and this AI assistants then can come back to you with the voice as well. So you can talk to it, and then you will come back with voice. Uh, in the same conversation. Now, uh, we introduced that during the Engage conference, and there's a lot of things that are happening behind the scenes for that, and we can talk about some of the state-of-the-art components and where we are, but that's essentially what we introduced, right? It's the same thing that ChatGPT has on their app if you're using it on the mobile, but now we've, we've introduced it into our AI assistance, which, I mean, it's, it's really surprising to me that we're in it every single day and like we see that as a progression, but a lot of folks were, that was the wow moment, right? A lot of folks were, wow, this is incredible because of the intonation and the quality of the voice and how good the accent and all these things were, which is incredible, right? That's that's the that's where we got the wow effect. A lot of folks haven't really connected that, you know, it's not robotic anymore. Like text to speech is not robotic. It's actually very, very human like. Yeah. The the the, the advancement of 
detection of accents, you know, f uh, flows of speech is incredible. Or at the highest level, at the highest level here, what's happening? I see the button, I get it. So is it just they're speaking out my language and it's translating then sending the prompt? Is that happening at the highest level or, or inherently? Is there something different, a, truly a language model? Or is it just basically a translation layer so that the element works the same way as if I enter a prompt? What is happening here? Uh, it's um, So there's two things that are happening, right? One of them is what's there right now, and then the state of the art, like what we're, what we're building. What's happening right now is there is very few models that are, there's a, there's a small delay, right? That there is a 200, 300 millisecond delay. We talked about GPT-4.0 a few weeks ago that uh, OpenAI announced it. Well, they haven't made that available for people to use yet. There is a couple other models, maybe Gemini, but uh, we'll talk about this other uh, company that just released one of their uh, open source uh, real-time models. But what's happening is essentially your voice can be translated into text, gets converted into text, transcribed, the model, the LLM, a response back in text, and then you do that, you transform that text to speech by using a, a, a what's called a TTS or a text-to-speech model, and then that gets returned. So that's what's been happening over the past uh, few months. Like we've had that technology and that's what, you know, that was the earlier proof of concept ideas that, that are available today. Now that is going to require, of course, they've gone faster and faster, but it's a little bit slower. So the transcription part, we use, it's used Whisper, which is the OpenAI open source models, but also it's really, really good at transcribing. There's voice, there's noise in, in there. There's a lot of things that are happening that can happen in the background. It's really good at picking up and, and transcribing in multiple languages. So it's, it's great at that. So the Whisper models, are transcribing things into text. And then, of course, you can use whatever models you want for that. And then on the response back, you use the text-to-speech models. The best text-to-speech models, perhaps you've used something called 11 Labs. Have you used 11 Labs before? No, I haven't. So 11 Labs is probably one of the earlier text-to-speech mm -hmm. companies, and they have a lot of voices. So essentially they've taken, think about like voice jockey or, you know, one of these earlier voice actors sites where you put in a script and then you, you select whichever voice you want. And then it goes out and it bids into a job and somebody like a voice actor reads your script and then now you get back. So it's the same thing. So 11 Labs, it's something very similar where they have synthetic voices and you can actually build your own voice as well, or you can train your own voice in there, your own synthetic voice. And then now it, it can be, hey, this is my JC voice. And then you can type anything and you can give any type of text and you will convert that to speech, right? So with all the intonations and all of that. So those 11 labs has built some of the most advanced text to speech models out there and we use it commercially today right so we use it for some of our video so video overlays or videos voiceovers and so on and so forth so that's that's one part of it but still there is a delay right so you have to convert things to text so then what ended up happening is OpenAI said okay rather than converting stuff into text this models can understand voice because it's a multimodal model, yeah. right? So it's multimodal, it's trained on voice, text, video, images, all of this stuff. And it understands that intuitively. So rather than having that transcription, which delays thing, you can now stream in an audio file or an audio stream. It will understand that and reply back with an audio stream as well. So that's the beauty of having a multimodal model or an audio model, there is no delay. And they have gotten that to a point where it's actually below 300 milliseconds, which is the delay that we perceive or, or, or how fast we respond to each other and understand something. So you're listening to me, but there's a 300 millisecond delay between what I'm saying and kind of your understanding and your brain. And then you're able to respond within 300 milliseconds of me stopping because you understood everything that I said. So that's the human delay perception.
in, in a way, what you are introducing to me and on, in our audience here is that the advancement of this language models, I'm sorry, voice models, it's that it's no longer translating. So I'm going to give you the application of uh, language, right, in terms of being bilingual. So when I first started speaking English, right, so if the word, let's say, blue came, and in my brain I heard blue, and I'm translating in my brain, oh, that means azul, it's a color, so now I understand. So what happened in my brain is that I hear it, I need to translate it, map it into the my native language, and then now I can do it. When you become fluent, that doesn't take place, and it kind of gives you that fluency, that, you know, blue means a color, so I can go, I, I'm, okay, I'm, we're talking about colors, and I can come and say back red or green and things like that. This type of capability has been basically achieved in generative AI that it happens at a speed that gives fluency to the voice model so you can then have a conversation. So just want to give people an, an application here. This is super exciting because back on my travel application from our prior episode, I spoke about translation and there's there's a kinky delay, right? That it's like, all right, come, come. And then it comes and then there's no true fluidity. But it seems that now we basically crack that problem. Yeah, exactly. And and we've talked a little bit about this with our when we talked about multimodal models and how these models mm -hmm. think in multi modes. It's exactly that. And then two episodes ago, we talked about mapping the mind of an LLM, where we discussed how these concepts get formed inside the neural net. There's these areas, right? But they don't get just activated on on text, right? Because if these multimodal models are trained on multiple media, they also, like, they understand the concept of blue as a painting, they understand it as a word, they understand it in different languages. So they all map into the same space, right? The same concept space. And then when you're, you're triggering it, when you're feeding something into it, it's in the same space, right? So it doesn't matter. And, and then it's able to respond back in that different mode. So it's like the multimodal capabilities are really, really interesting. And, and that's what we've been talking about, the large language models with uh, Gemini 1.5 and even GPT-4.0. So keep that in mind, right? That's, that's, that's the benefit of having this. But the interesting part to your point is now you, there's no delay anymore. You don't have to press translate it goes ahead and does the translation and then you have to hand the phone back and then it's just the person speaks and then you have to listen. So this delay can become a little bit awkward, especially when you're not in front of somebody and when there is a delay on the other side. Now think about the implications of like, can you use this over your phone? So it's like, can you have- The bandwidth requirement, it's a killer right now. I can tell you. So is, is this getting better now as you deploy on the phone? Is it leaner? No, I think I think the audio is is pretty low bandwidth when you think about it. Audio video is very high bandwidth, but audio is pretty low bandwidth. The interesting thing here is you have multi-channel communication engines. So like for Element, we have text, email, we also introduced WhatsApp and we also introduced uh phone calling from Element. Oh, that's exciting. So somebody can call in and they, you can call somebody and like a person needs to be on this side and you have to be, you can be on the other side. So Element has the voice over telephone. So you're ringing a student or you're ringing a parent or whoever, and you're having a conversation. Now this allows us to actually have an AI assistant do the phone calling rather than, you know, rather than having somebody uh, like a real person, an AI assistant can do the phone calling back and forth and can have that conversation over the phone with that student. It doesn't have to be over text or or a chat bubble or or anything like that. It can actually be a real time conversation over phone. Yeah, that's the app, right? That literally, not the app. That's just an interesting application that the the fluidity and the agility and the speed allows you to literally mimic a phone call because it will be in context. A human, but it's not right. That's that's the clear application. Exactly, and then this large language model, like the the models are really really good. So it's it's exactly the same thing that you're getting in text. But now imagine a uh, really warm or or personality that comes through uh, as well as part of this because language is really really important. I mean, of course, GPT four O is not available yet for some of the more advanced capabilities. And we're still waiting on that. However, there's other alternatives. And one of them that was just introduced very recently 
was from a company called Kutai, and this is very, very exciting. It was, um, they introduced it last week, but this is a French AI research lab called Kutai. Oh, the French again, the French again. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me more. I uh, mean, Mistral, uh, I forget how to pronounce it, but man, the French are doing incredible things with uh, open AI. So tell me more about this company. So you don't have to have a multimodal model, right? You can, you can have a purpose-built model just for voice. So if you're going to deploy just voice, mm -hmm. you don't have to have a multimodal model in order to do the back and forth. And so you can just train it on voice data and it becomes a lot smaller. It doesn't need to be trained on, on a lot of text or, or images and video and things like that. So what the company Kutai has done, they've introduced a new model called Moshi. And what's interesting about Moshi is that audio only, and it can handle two audio streams simultaneously. So it allows you to listen and talk at the same time. Ah, uh, okay. That gives you the fluidity, yeah. Yeah. Just like we're we're talking over each other right now, and I still listen. Yeah, I'm listening yeah. to you, and I can talk and change my conversation. So it allows for both of these. So it can be a dynamic conversational setting, like customer support or or even student support or these agents. You know, it's it's really interesting because you know somebody interrupts, like the interruption point. It's like, well, how do you know it's interrupting, right? Unless you finish. So that that is really really cool, and that's something that we're looking into as well. Because when you're over audio, that's that's in interesting. The emotional range, it can express 70 different emotions and speaking styles. It can become more natural and expressive. What's interesting around it is because it's a smaller model, it can actually run on device without needing to connect to the cloud. That's that's what I was talking about bandwidth. So this is actually, yeah. in terms of if bandwidth is not a problem, so the second problem was how heavy it is on your, your device. It is not. It's not, exactly. That's great. Exactly. So like, imagine now when you can talk to Siri or whatever, and uh, you don't have to actually go to the internet. It's like, it can be very natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the device, which is pretty pretty incredible, right? So now you can deploy this in a lot of different places. It's Because it's open source, you can have it in your own mm -hmm. kind of infrastructure and you can do a lot of things with it. So the cost will come down. And of course it's it's open source, right? So they're they're allowing developers and researchers to build on on that as well. This is open source, right? Open source. Yep. Interesting. Yep. So now we're seeing the first voice model that's, that's open source, uh, which is which is really really interesting. So the 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 part that's interesting here, <laughs> which is incredible, right? They were able to guess how many people it took to train this model. Like how much, how many resources do you think it took? I don't know a million people. It's you know it's all about volume. So I guess the answer is not, but I would say a million people because it's a ton of variations and intonations and whatnot. What's the answer? Actually, no. So it took him six months, and a team of eight scientists built this model. How is that possible? So six months, eight scientists. You're talking about people that the humans to do the work. I'm thinking about training. Okay, I got it, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we're talking about like the size of the company. So you don't need a large company like Google or whatever to do these things anymore. Okay, okay, okay. I understand the question, right? But also like to your point is like it, it took him 100,000 synthetic dialogues. Jesus. So the way that they trained this, which is incredible, right? So we talked about text to speech before. They use text to speech to synthesize 100,000 dialogues back and forth. So they didn't need to hire voice actors, right? They essentially created the dialogues from text. They synthesized them with the text to speech they can use in 11 labs or the text to speech from OpenAI or whatever other models to convert them into audio. And then they trained this model in those conversations over audio. So it, it helped the AI learn like nuances of human speech, um, which was, of course, they, they used the professional voice artists to kind of enhance the quality of that even further. But the base of the training data was yeah, synthetic yes. data, which is really interesting because one of the biggest on the hardest things that, that this models or this AI companies have hit come across now is data. How, how do they get the data to train bigger and better models? That was my point on a million, right? Exactly. So AI training AI type of thing. So exactly. Synthetic data basically allowing us to basically create uh, spin-offs of an algorithm. This is incredible. Artists, 
I just need to sign off because I'm, I need I need seven people now to create my next company. That's what that that's what I'm just learning from you, my friend. So exciting. That's it. That's that's it, right? I think Sam Altman had a quote a couple of months ago. It said the next billion dollar company will only have about ten people, and eventually, over the next few years, it'll just be one person billion dollar wow. company, right? It's like, you know, because you can do this these kinds of things, which is which is incredible. Interesting. So, so that's what's really really exciting that this this model is available. It's open source. It it kind of has this dual stream, so you can kind of reply back and then let's see over here oh the latency is actually approximately 200 milliseconds so it's less than open ai the the gpt 40 voice which is uh which is really really interesting so what i'm expecting right now is probably uh i drop from chat gpt right the open ai folks i probably drop from gemini to basically reduce yeah. the delta of where where they've gotten and we'll see what happens but really really exciting and the opportunity basically to interact natively with applications, gigantic. Yeah, and we're, we're very excited about this because it opens up those, those capabilities for sure. Did I explain it all right? Oh my God, not only you explained it all right, I'm really excited about the promise of, this is what I'm hearing, right? What I'm hearing is voice models existed as a translation layer, right? So he translated and sent the, I guess, the, the text so the LMs can do what they do. What we're finding right now is that this deployment in a lean, highly low latency, highly basically computational agile methodology allows two conversations taking place. The receiver, the sender, and they can do what you and I do as humans, interrupt each other, laugh at each other, build from each other, and make it in a human-like way. And that's basically what these voice models take place. Also, what I'm learning is that it didn't take the billions of dollars that OpenAI needed to launch their first generation of chat GPTs. In this case, it took very, very small footprint in terms of resources and time because synthetic AI now starts launch, launching training models, synthetic data, right? Um, and it's basically super, super exciting. And also what I'm hearing is Element has it and it's just gonna become much, much better as it you know, moves forward, right? <laughs> That's it. Yeah, exactly. So we're moving away from just text-based. We're we're moving towards you know voice and and other modalities for this AI assistance as well. Well, this is very exciting for us. We'll keep you uh, everybody updated and and bring any new news that's happening in this space. Uh, we have a, obviously an interest at Element Four Fifty One because we're we're innovating and kind of adding this to our product. So as we have user adoption and as we kind of bring this to the market. Uh, and then users start adopting it, we'll, we'll kind of bring our learnings uh, to this podcast for sure. JC, any lasting words? Artists, thank you for the walkthrough. It's super exciting. And everybody, subscribe, send us the five stars. We want to grow this so we can bring you more of these conversations. Everybody, have a wonderful rest of the summer, and we'll see you on episode 33. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Until next time. Generation AI is part of the Enrollify podcast network. If you like this podcast, chances are you're going to like other Enrollify shows too. Our podcast network is growing weekly, and we've got a wide range of marketing, enrollment, and higher ed technology shows that are jam-packed with stories, ideas, and frameworks, all designed to empower you to be a better higher ed professional. Our shows help higher ed leaders and professionals like you find their next big idea. They feature a selection of the industry's best as your hosts, like Jamie Hunt, Seth O'Dell, Jenny Lee Fowler, Brian Gross, and many of your favorite leaders in higher ed. Enrollify is made possible by Element 451, the next generation AI student engagement platform that's helping institutions all over the country create meaningful, personalized, and engaging connections with their prospects and students. Learn more at element451.com.